welcome to um, the second session of um, the webinar series that we're running in the School of Public Health at the University of the Western Cape um, on rapid reviews and scoping reviews. Um, my name is E. Schmidt. And um, today we have um, presenters um, joining us, so I won't be the one delivering today's session, but um, please do uh, go and look at um, last week's recording, which was a broad introduction on different types of systematic reviews if you weren't at the webinar. Um, and also um, this session will be recorded, so um, you will also be able to have access to it um, after today. Um, I just uh, want to ask anyone who um, would like to get CPD points for you to please send your Health Professional Council um, number to the host. Um, and that's just for us to be able to keep a record of it and to be able to then make sure that you do get um, your CPD points. Um, so yeah, before um, I introduce you to our, our presenter, Lisa Fadenhauer, um, I'm just going to um, ask us to um, complete a Mentimeter and this is just um, to make sure that we know who you are. Um, it's, it's quite challenging with these large webinars to know who's here. And so I think the Mentimeter will help us with that. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Zianda, um, who will take us through the Mentimeter and then we'll come back um, for the presentation. Um, hello everyone. So I've just put in a link um, in the chat box. If you could just click on the link, it will take you to um, a set of questions and I will take you through. B, can you see the responses? Yes, I can. Thanks. All right. So I'll give it a couple of more seconds and then we'll move to the second question. Yeah. Yeah, so great to see that um, we've got a range of people. Um, I think this might be more useful for you, Lisa and Jake. Um, so academics, health professionals, technical support staff or advisory staff, full-time students, um, and other. Um, I think for whoever is other, it would be really good if you could maybe put in the chat just for us to know what other is, um, just for us to also be able to increase our options of knowing who, who actually attends these webinars. Right, so I'll move to the second question. Are you excited to start work, babe? You should be able to see the second question. How so? Okay, so I'm um, also quite a distribution in terms of um, people with qualitative research skills, experience, and quantitative, as well as um, mixed method researchers. It's really great to see a lot more mixed method researchers um, emerging. Um, I think that's a very useful skill to have in terms of conducting reviews. All right, um, I'll stop sharing and then in the chat box, I'll, I'll paste, um, I'll share another link. And if you can click to that link, it'll take us to the third and fourth question.
Yeah, it'd be great to see that um, that diverse also reasons why people are here. Um, so the majority to conduct a review, but also good to see that people are interested in teaching um, content on reviews and also applying it um, in terms of the evidence that comes from the reviews. So it seems even in terms of um, who's attended a webinar or training on reviews before. Um, yeah, that makes for a really interesting um, audience, I think, for the presentation. Um, and just on this note, to just also um, ask you to please share any uh, questions that you have or any comments that you have while Lisa is presenting in the chat. Um, and we'll go through all of those. There'll be a lot of time to um, discuss and respond to questions this afternoon. Um, and so, yeah, that will be great um, so that you don't forget and we can keep track of them as, as Lisa goes through the presentation. So I'll stop sharing again and then I'll post the last link, which will take us to questions five and six. So um, yeah, the majority of people um, are saying no to not having done a rapid review before. Um, so I think this is the right webinar for you to attend. Um, I think we have one more question, um, Zianda. Whoa, a whole range of um, responses, but I see um, things related to policymaking, um, 
thing as someone is saying they don't have an idea it's great that you're here to publish an article um, to get evidence on a topic quickly um, yeah so i think there are quite a, a wide range of re of of um sort of things that are motivating people to want to do rapid reviews I think um, the one about thesis, that's also another kind of um, option for, for um, why you would want to do a rapid review. Um, clinical decision-making. Yeah, so I think um, really good to see all these reasons and all of them very valid and um, we'll now go into the presentation. So will um, hand over to um, Lisa Fadenhauer and Jake Spurns, um, who are researchers at the School of Public Health at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Um, and they both have expertise in evidence synthesis and knowledge translation. So um, we're very fortunate to have them both here today. Um, over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also thank you very much for inviting us um, to talk to you about rapid reviews today. And with me is my colleague Jacob Burns, who uh, um, is also based at the University of Munich. Um, uh, we have been working with B um, for several years now and partly we've been working on um, um, evidence synthesis, not necessarily rapid reviews, but other forms of evidence synthesis and also the uptake in um, decision-making in um, practice and policy. So it was really interesting to see um, that a lot of you know systematic or uh, rapid reviews. I'll, that will happen to me all the time now. I'm talking about systematic reviews, but I'm actually meaning rapid reviews. Um, and it was also interesting to see that some of you already did a rapid review. Which brings me to my next question, and I um, please ask you to post your response in the chat. If you have done a rapid review, did you call it a rapid review or did you use any other um, name for it? Just post your answer into the chat. It would be really interesting to see what you called your rapid review. Very good first answer. <laughs> yeah, so rapid review. I assume that most of you call it then a rapid review, which is not too common because um, for quite some time um, reviews have been, uh, rapid reviews have been around, but they haven't really necessarily, um, thank you, systematic review, yeah. They haven't necessarily been called rapid review. So. They're all forms of different labels which are being used to refer to a rapid review. Um, and those are just a few examples which I found, for example, a rapid structures evidence review, a rapid meta review, rapid appraisal. So there are many, many forms of um, labels which are used to refer to rapid reviews. Um, which brings me to my next question, which you kindly answered in the Mentimeter a um, couple of minutes ago. Um, uh, the rationale behind conducting rapid reviews. And I just quickly took some notes to, um, to follow up on uh, your comments on what the rationale behind conducting rapid reviews would be. And the things I captured was that it was a synthesis, that it was quick, quick or rapid. Um, it is informing policy making. Um, it's mostly on a novel topic. It should be good and fast. And um, it has the aim of publishing, which could have several motivations, um, getting your thesis out, but also getting your publications up. So there are a lot of um, reasons behind why people um, are publishing or, or conducting and then hopefully publishing their rapid reviews. And I just showed you that there were a lot of labels which are used to refer to rapid reviews. And in the same way that there are multiple labels to refer to rapid reviews, there are different ways of defining rapid reviews. So there's a lot of uncertainty what people mean when they actually do a, a rapid review. Um, a team around Hamlet Al conducted a thematic analysis of definitions which have been used in more than 200 reviews. 
And when they did this um, analysis, they found that um, there were actually eight major themes which surrounded the definition and then what people actually did when they did a rapid review. So most um, uh, commonly mentioned was that it uh, involved a accelerated or rapid process. Um, there was a variation in method shortcuts. Um, there were comments or there were um, references made to the focus or the scope of the rapid review. It mostly contained a comparison or contrast to a systematic review. So for example, the definition would say, compared to a systematic reviews, there are some methodological variations. So there would be the contrast to a systematic review in the definition. It always, um, or not always, many of them involved a stakeholder rationale. So um, some of you commented in the Mentimeter that it involves or it should inform the rapid review and its findings should inform um, policy making and decision making. And one of those components would be maybe also the stakeholder rationale. Another reason was the resource efficiency rationale. So that due to whatever reason you have to make use of your resources efficiently, um, could be that you have limited uh, manpower, but could also be that you are in need of a rapid response. So time might be the limit or um, funding. So there could be many um, different resources which should be used efficiently. Um, it entails a systematic approach as it does a systematic review. Um, and there were some references to bias limitations which can be limited by conducting a rapid review when, for example, compared to a narrative review. Um, and you have been um, received a introduction to reviews in general already, um, right B? So um, uh, rapid review is just one of the members of the family of systematic reviews. Um, thus, it does not seem um, surprising to most of you, I assume, that, um, rep that reviews and systematic reviews in general are supposed to limit bias and limitations by um, encompassing very uh, thorough and strict methods. So lastly, this was more or less the definition that they came up with after having conducted this thematic analysis of rapid reviews, which have been done over the past years. And they define a rapid review now as a form of knowledge synthesis that accelerates the process of conducting a traditional systematic review through streamlining or omitting specific methods to produce evidence for stakeholders in a resource efficient manner. And one of, the, um, one of the very important aspects about rapid reviews is also that they should be driven primarily by requests for timely evidence for decision-making purposes, uh, including to address urgent and emergent health issues and questions deemed to be of high priority. Um, I am not sure how familiar you are with uh, the Cochrane collaboration or as it, called now, as it is called now Cochrane. So I have a one slide prepared for you to explain what Cochrane is. And the reason why I explain it to you is that I am referring a lot to the Cochrane, or mostly to the Cochrane guidance today and how we used it in two rapid reviews we conducted over the past month. Cochrane is a um, collaboration which is charitable and it is formed to organize medical research findings. Also in, for the past decades in public health, it facilitates and guides the conduct of systematic review for reviews of healthcare interventions, public health interventions, and also diagnostic tests. It provides thorough guidance on how to conduct these systematic reviews. And of reason, it also provides guidance on how to conduct rapid reviews, which I'm going to introduce you to. Um, and it hopes to facilitate evidence-based choices about health interventions involving health professionals, patients, and policymakers. So Cochrane also has a very strong focus on stakeholder engagement um, and making their work relevant. I am not sure if anyone is familiar with Cochrane and has worked with Cochrane, but Cochrane is one of the major player when it comes to uh, the field of systematic reviews. I would like to ask you another question. Maybe you can also put your answer in the chat again. Um, if you compare the rapid review with a systematic review, do you have any idea which steps could be streamlined or omitted compared to a systematic review in order to make it faster, um, in order to make more efficient use of your um, resources? So I would please like to ask you to put some answers in the chat um, to let me know which steps you think can be streamlined. Critical appraisal.
Yeah, searching fewer databases, very good point. Two votes of critical appraisal. Divide tasks in screening, so screening, the step of screening, yeah. Yeah, databases, shorter time period, which could be, could mean different things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for language and database limits. Um, so database limit, database limits, period of time frame. Yeah, one review of full text screening instead of two. In terms of number of years, okay, yeah. Which you include your um, publications into your rapid review. Question, very good point. Um, I think that's something every systematic reviewer experienced um, at some point in their systematic review career that the re research questions rather brought <laughs> very specific, should be very specific for a rapid review. Yeah, good point. The question should be included. Not sure how to, the PICO, yeah, limitations to the PICO, very good point. Yeah. So uh, you raised already very important and relevant uh, points where the process can be cut short. And I'd like to take you through a rapid review process, um, which I hope for those of you who, according to the Mentimeter, want to conduct a rapid review in the future, um, can be easily followed by you. And I will demonstrate these steps also by showing or introducing you to two examples. So this would be more or less the rapid review process um, according to the Cochrane guidance on rapid reviews. And this guidance has been published in 2020. Um, so uh, Garrity et al. have been publishing on uh, an interim guidance actually, which was developed by Cochrane over the past years. They wanted to publish it for a long time, but um, they only did so when they, the COVID-19 pandemic um, came up and there was a strong need for guidance on how to conduct these rapid review. So they published an interim guidance, which will be um, valid until the, the full guidance appears. And this interim guidance suggests the following seven, no, it's eight steps, <laughs> which um, starts with setting a research question, setting the eligibility criteria, searching, study selection, data extraction, risk of bias assessment, synthesis, and other aspects. So if we're looking at this chart of a process described um, by this interim guidance, it's quite interesting to see that according to um, these steps, if you compare to a systematic review process, it looks like there's not too much difference, but maybe the devil is in the detail. So we'll move on to um, introducing you to the two examples. Um, I would like to demonstrate how we operationalize this interim guidance um, into rapid reviews, which we conducted in our research group. The first review which we um, conducted was actually the one which is second on the slide, so it's a bit um, not consistent. <laughs> um, it was a rapid review on international travel related control measures to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was led by my colleague, Jake Burns, who's um, co-leading the session with me. Um, and it was published um, in, the first version was published in um, January and the update was published in March. So it's pretty recent. Um, and the second one is a, um, a rapid review on um, measures implemented in the school setting. So we looked at um, which measures work to keep schools open to facilitate an in-person um, teaching. And this was also conducted with Cochrane. So let's start with setting a research question. The Cochrane guidance strongly encourages people to involve key stakeholders. I mentioned that before. Um, so it could be consumers, health professionals, policymakers, and other decision makers to set and refine the review question, the eligibility criteria, and also to um, uh, maybe make a choice about the outcomes of interest. So for example, um, for school measures, um, they would say, look at not only the health-related outcomes, but also make sure that you look at educational outcomes 
um, that would be something where consumers could help um, setting the research question. Um, then you can consult with the stakeholders through the process to ensure that the research question is fit for purpose and um, maybe it could lead to any ad hoc changes during the re review process, which could be also informed by consultations with stakeholders. Um, then you should, and that also applies for systematic reviews, but it also applies for um, rapid reviews. You should develop a protocol that includes the review questions, PCOS, and inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what we did with this first aspect, setting a research question. So on the left, you see the challenges we um, faced, and on the right, you see how we address these challenges. So first and foremost, and I think that applies to many of the COVID-related research topics, was that there was a very high need for decision makers to address various topics. Um, so they had many, many topics which they had to choose off, and their priorities, what, what the top priority level um, or the top priority topic was um, also changed um, rapidly. So what we did, um, we kind of conducted a mapping and identified uh, topics which were relevant together with stakeholders. One of them was the World Health Organization, but we also formed a public health stakeholder advisory panel, and we tried to prioritize these topics um, with them. Um, some of them were more or less commissioned to us because um, there was a strong need or a high need for guidance, but some of us, some, some of these topics were kind of narrowed down and lastly we ended with travel related control measures and the measures implemented in the school setting. Um, with regards to the eligibility criteria, that is something um, which was mentioned in the chat by some of you, clearly define the population intervention comparator and outcomes and potentially limit any of these PICOs, so any of the population, the interventions, comparators, and outcomes. Um, something was also which was also mentioned um, by some of you was, was to consider date restrictions. Those have to be justified. Um, you can also apply restrictions to the setting you're looking at. Um, you can, of course, make choices with regards to which language to include. That often has to do something with the resources available. So um, we are usually, in our team, we're um, usually including studies based on the languages which the team members speak, um, so which languages we can cover within the, re um, the review team, and potentially add other languages um, if that is justified. One thing which is one of the bigger differences to systematic reviews is that a systematic review itself should be considered a relevant study design for inclusion. and um, you are also encouraged to place a higher emphasis on higher quality study designs, um, which is sometimes easier said than done, um, which I'm gonna demonstrate you in a second. So as most of you know, or all of you know, um, defining the eligibility criteria during the COVID-19 pandemic was challenging. Um, the evidence base was changing daily. Um, it was very rapidly changing. Um, there were unclear, study designs which were used, um, it was just a big mess. Um, so when we were kind of started working on our research question, we were kind of a bit lost with what to specifically look at. And since we had to do a rapid review to quickly provide um, evidence synthesis, we, uh, we were kind of tempted to jump on the topic and just start working on it. But something which, um, we rather did, and I think both Jake and I are rather grateful that we um, did that, was we conducted a formal scoping. So we conducted a rapid scoping review for the school measures, and we conducted an evidence map for the travel-related control measures, just to see what's out there. And while this, of course, took some time, um, in the case of the school review, it took um, six weeks, I think, in the case of the evidence map for the travel-related co control measures, it took only 10 days. While it cost some time to the team, it kind of was really important for us to inform the limitations with regards to interventions and the settings. So, for example, for the travel-related um, control measures, um, we were able to narrow it down to travel measures that cross national borders rather than, for example, in-country um, in um, travel restrictions. So for example, the um, stay-at-home policy, I don't know whether that's the correct term, 
um, and for the school meshes, for example, we also um, put a limit to the meshes we would be looking at because um, by the time we conducted the scoping, we found out that there was a review being conducted on school closures. So we cut out of that measure. So we said we're not looking at measures that close schools. And we would rather look at measures that enable school to operate um, as an open facility or the school building opening. And we also uh, imposed some restrictions with regards to the, um, the setting of the school. So we um, kind of did not look at childcare settings um, or university or college settings because um, the population would have been very different. The measures would have worked very differently. Um, one of the most, I think the major challenges, and this is nothing which applies specifically to rapid reviews, but would also in the same extent apply to a systematic review if we would have conducted one, would be um, study design. So it was just a very big mess when it came to study design. Uh, we had many different types of studies being conducted on the questions of interests. Um, and while we, as uh, our team who has mostly been working on public health measures, um, we were used to work with experimental, quasi-experimental um, and observational studies, but, um, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are aware, aware of that, that a large percentage of the studies published on um, these measures and how they worked. Um, one of the most important and widely cited papers was the one by Neil Ferguson, which was published in the very beginning of the pandemic, was a modeling study. So we had to make amendments to our usual traditional working um, style of including experimental and observational studies only. And we also had to include some modeling studies, which um, came, yeah, <laughs> yeah, which imposed some other challenges, with, which I'm going to address later. So the next step would have been search methods. Involve an information specialist. I think that is something which I can recommend um, from the depth of my heart for everyone conducting a systematic review because it's just extremely helpful to have someone on board who actually um, knows how to set up search strategies, which um, database might retrieve the best results for your research question. So I think that is something which um, applies to rapid reviews, but more reviews in general. Then limit main database searching to central, Medline, and Embase. So that would be the limitations, which was also mentioned by some of you in the chat, lim limitations to the databases. Um, if you are conducting a, a search for a very specific topic, for example, the school measures topic, but also for the um, travel restrictions, you might consider also um, searching other sources if that seems appropriate, appropriate for the research question at hand. Um, Consider the peer review of at least um, one search strategy, also um, quite uh, recommendable. Then put limits to gray literature searches and supplemental searches um, to the minimum. Um, yeah, and if justified, search study registries and scan the reference lists of other systematic reviews or included studies after having screened abstracts and full text. Um, yeah, so the problem with COVID-19 related research was that a lot of it was not indexed in databases because it was published as a preprint. So we needed to look for databases and search databases which included those preprints because otherwise you would have missed the major part of the research was published. I think in our um, review, 33 out of 38 included studies were published as preprints and the way we've been including them we would have missed them if we wouldn't have uh, searched um, databases that index preprints. Um, also, what we found was that some of the relevant studies were not published as either a preprint or a scientific publication, a peer-reviewed publication. So um, we addressed this challenge um, by first searching COVID-19 databases, as well as topic-specific databases, for example, ERIC for school rapid review, or the school rapid review, um, and other databases which index the preprints. And we conducted forward and backward searches of previously published systematic reviews, guidelines, and included studies. So um, we tried to um, cover everything um, by not only limiting to these previously mentioned databases, but rather applying a broad um, search 
strategy. The next step in the process would be to do the title and abstract and full text screening. Um, the Cochrane guidance here suggests that you are using a standardized title and abstract form, conduct a pilot exercise using the same 30 or 50 abstracts for the entire screening team, then use two reviewers for dual screening of at least 20% of abstracts with conflict resolution if there should be disagreement, and use one reviewer to screen the remaining abstracts and the second reviewer to screen all excluded abstracts, and if needed, resolve conflicts. So after 20%, one review goes off to screen the rest and the other one only looks at the excluded abstracts. And then after studies have been moved one step further to full text screening, um, you can use a standardized full text form, uh, conduct a pilot exercise again of the same five to 10 full texts for the entire screening team to calibrate and then test this review form. And then use one reviewer to screen all included full text articles and a second reviewer to screen all excluded full text articles. So the journey more or less departs um, after the calibration exercise. So what happened um, with screening in our team during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, since we uh, um, experienced quite a strong increase or high, uh, crazy increase in um, the demand for reviews, we had to hire a lot of um, new staff, some of them had some experience with um, reviews, but some of them hadn't. Um, so we had to do a very extensive calibration. Uh, we had to do very um, extensive trainings for um, junior uh, reviewers. Um, and we more or less found that due to first the way our team was at that point um, composed, but also to the way the studies were described and conducted we would employ Java screening on all stages. We uh, um, further kept a rolling question sheet where we tried to capture the most um, important questions that arose during the title and abstract screening and the full text screening. And we tried to discuss these questions on a daily and depending on how the pace of our um, rapid review was, um, daily or weekly meetings where we tried to discuss that and see um, how things are going in the team for screening. So that's how we did that. Um, what we also did was to always pair a more experienced uh, screener with a less experienced screener to make sure that um, none of these things are being missed. The next step would be data extraction. So after you included your full text um, into your review, you would start with um, data extraction. The guidance suggest suggests to use a single review to extract data using a piloted form. And then it recommends to use the second review to check for correctness and completeness of the extracted data. Um, then also they suggest to limit your data extraction to a minimal set of required data items, which I think comes quite natural considering the limited resources at hand. And also consider using data from existing systematic reviews to reduce time spent on data extraction. Um, so the challenge we had with data extraction was again that we had um, some less experienced people on board um, which we needed to facilitate the rapid um, process and there were some consistency challenges which uh, made our or which made it quite uh, obviously very complicated to proceed to synthesis so we made sure that we did intensive calibration we also um, found that after um, going for the solution of having one person doing the data extraction and the second person checking on it, that there were so many major changes to data extractions for mostly consistency reasons that in the end, we did um, the data extraction only within the core team, which means that we had a um, the primary two first authors, we had a shared, shared first authorship on those reviews and a senior author. So the data extractions were done by um, the core team and due to the novel um, character of the topic, so there was no previous reviews conducted on the question at hand, we uh, were not able to use data extractions undertaken for other reviews. Risk of bias assessment. So um, while some of you mentioned that this could be a valid shortcut in a rapid review, uh, the guidance suggests to do risk of bias assessment and uh, also use a valid risk of um, bias tool 
if that is available for the included study designs, which is a big caveat. Use a single reviewer to rate risk of bias um, with full verification of all judgments by a second reviewer. Um, limit risk of bias ratings to the most important outcomes with a focus on, these, on those most important for decision making. This is also where the um, decision makers come in. Um, and this is uh, how we, um, what happened to us during the review process. Um, again, we had, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, a mix um, in our team of people who had more experience. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I uh, did not change the challenges here. Those are the old challenges, but the first point equally applies to here. So um, we had to make sure that the rapid or uh, the uh, risk bias assessment was done by the senior members in the team. So we had to uh, make sure that the team that does the risk of bias assessment is um, composed by senior researchers. Um, and we made sure that there was a minimum of two people looking at the risk of bias assessment. So sometimes um, we had uh, one person doing the risk of bias assessment and a second person um, validating the risk of bias assessment. And sometimes what we did was um, that two people um, together looked at the study and did the risk of bias assessment if, if it was a really complex one. Um, all of the judgments were made in the team. Um, so to make sure that we have the risk of bias assessment um, in place. Synthesis. Um, oops. The guidance recommends to synthesize evidence narratively um, and consider a meta-analysis analysis only if appropriate. So only if the studies are similar enough to form. Um, the standards for conducting the meta-analysis are equal um, equally apply to a rapid review when compared to a systematic review. And it also recommends to use a single reviewer to grade the certainty of guidance, so applying grade with verification of all judgments by a second reviewer. Um, so the challenge we had, again, very heterogeneous data. So we were not able to um, conduct a meta-analysis as suggested by Cochrane. Um, we did a narrative synthesis ratified by intervention type and outcome. We further separated the synthesis for the real world studies and the modeling studies. So all of the studies that did a quasi-experimental design or an observational um, design allowing for inferences, we put in one group and the other um, group would have been modeling studies. So we separated those and reported um, for those separately. And we um, employed a staged or phased approach to the synthesis. So we started off by um, study by study tables, describing the intervention effects, because the way some of these modeling studies report um, their results was quite challenging to, to describe. And sometimes some of the data were only presented graphically, which made it really hard to, um, to extract the actual intervention effect. We um, developed the summary of findings tables and we tried to determine the overall direction of the effect. Um, some other aspects that are recommended by the Cochrane guidance are that all these rapid reviews should be preceded by a protocol submitted to and approved by Cochrane. These protocols should be registered um, either with Prospero or Open Science Framework. The um, rapid review should allow for post hoc changes to the protocol as part of an efficient iterative process. Um, but all of these changes should be documented um, yeah, to make sure that uh, those are captured. And then lastly, to incorporate the use of online systematic review software, which could be, for example, Covidence, um, Distiller, or Epi Reviewer to streamline the process. Um, in our case, we um, submitted a, we registered the rapid review with um, Cochrane. So we got in touch with them, said we would do a rapid review. They sent us the um, systematic review guidance, um, uh, uh, the rapid review guidance. Um, and they also sent our protocols out to the peer reviewers. They sent us some feedback and we uh, um, registered the protocols for both reviews with um, the open science framework. And we uh, implemented some post hoc changes, which we um, transparently documented in the final uh, review publications. Um, 
so one of the aspects that I have been mentioning before is that uh, rapid reviews are, um, or it is recommended to conduct these, system, these rapid reviews um, in answering the need of a decision maker. Um, but it is also quite clear that um, any accelerated evidence synthesis, um, synthesis comes with a potential trade-off in validity. Um, and um, colleagues from ours, they conducted a survey with decision makers um, that what they asked of a rapid review. And they stated um, that for the rapid review to be useful in practice, they expect the same conclusions as is in a systematic review in nine out of 10 products. So they expect the review to be equally um, valid with regards to the conclusion as systematic reviews. Um, so you see there might be a little dilemma there. Um, this team also um, put out some recommendations for the conduct of rapid reviews. So they said that rapid reviews are likely to be more applicable to focus clinical questions rather than complex public health questions. Um, it is also moreover recommended to make informed choices about the shortcuts to avoid loss of validity, to use um, automation tools for screening, for example, screen for me, and I hope they will be better software developed in the next um, years to come. Um, yeah, use experienced systematic reviews with complementary skills. Um, I think that is the perfect situation if you have a team composed of experienced systematic reviewers which have skills on doing um, risk of bias assessments and applying grade, um, but also having gone through a project of a rapid review in general. And something which I think uh, in our team also paid off is that the entire team blocked off time um, for the rapid review. Sorry, I um, did use the word systematic review, but uh, in that case, I mean a rapid review for the duration of the rapid review to make sure that people are able to fully focus and concentrate on um, this rapid review while everybody else is working on that. And um, just a few words to summarize um, our experience with conducting rapid reviews during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and Jake, please interrupt me if um, you want to make any comments on that. Um, so we had really large systematic review teams, um, some of them um, almost 20 co-authors. Um, so we had very large teams. It was very important to have coordination on board. So um, one of the first authors was most responsible for keeping communication up and coordinating the teams. So we formed teams around certain tasks where we always paired um, senior staff with more junior staff. So we had a Titan abstract screening team, a full text screening team, a data extraction team, a synthesis team, a, a risk of bias assessment team, a great team. So we had like all of these stages of the systematic reviews formed as teams to make sure that there was always um, a good composition of the review team to have the senior research on board and more junior stuff. Um, uh, we had part in some of these periods when we did these rapid reviews, we had daily meetings where we discussed um, the rolling questions and other issues that arose. So the coordination um, effort was really, I would say, yeah, uh, big. Um, and yeah, I think we all didn't really work eight hour <laughs> days during these periods. I think there were periods where some of us worked like 20 hours per day um, to get um, these rapid reviews out in time. Um, yeah, and while you can take some shortcuts in conducting rapid reviews, we also made the experience that most of these shortcuts really lead to the loss of validity, reliability of your findings, and were not worth the effort because it might require you to go back and um, look at some of this stuff again. Jake, please jump in. No, thanks, Lisa. I think that's a great summary. Uh, of, uh, and it also touches on some of the questions that people have asked in the chat. So I think some were interested in the number of actually people that were involved and I think Lisa touched on that well. I just I looked this up actually for something else earlier today and it was between 14 reviewers on the smallest review and 22 reviewers on the largest review. And as Lisa mentioned, it was really just about coordinating th that number of people across the different steps of a review and keeping things on time. And someone else asked, um, 
whether the people actually were only working on these reviews full time or whether they were also having to balance other tasks. And I think you mentioned that for the most part, the people working on these projects were focused at least for days at a time or even weeks at a time completely on these projects. And that was something that was feasible at a certain part of the pandemic. Um, I think at the beginning we were in what, what, what we started calling emergency mode, meaning that you know, there was a lot of external pressure for these, for these things to be conducted and delivered very, very quickly. Um, and I think that led to what uh, Lisa mentioned, you know, 16, 17, 18 uh, hour days. And at some point, I think both sides of the equation, both the researchers as well as the people sitting on the side looking for answers realized that this wasn't a sustainable model. And I think now we've moved from, you know, what we call the emergency mode back into, I think, what's a more realistic rapid mode. So instead of wanting an answer within 10 days, maybe now we have three months or four months to deliver an answer. And I think that is where we'll be back in a, a model of trying to balance the, the, the tasks we have in our everyday life, our everyday work, with conducting these, these rapid reviews that still need to be quick, that still need to be well coordinated, um, but also just fitting with the reality that we all have uh, regular public health jobs and uh, things that need to, to be happening that aren't always uh, necessarily related to these very pressing COVID questions. So that's just what I would follow up with Lisa on your last couple of comments. Thank you. Um, yeah, please go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say thank you to you, Lisa, um, for your presentation it was really detailed. And I think the format in which we'll go now is just to respond to some of the questions in the chat. Um, Jake, I think one of the questions that I had that might be useful for participants um, is something that you just mentioned now, and it's the question of actually around when is it um, appropriate to do a rapid review versus kind of a systematic review. I mean, you mentioned sort of the 10 days that you had to do rapid reviews. When would be a good time, actually, if you have three months? Does that mean that you should basically be going back to doing a full systematic review? Um, do you recommend you know, um, less restrictions on maybe the steps where you take shortcuts or kind of um, uh, try and, and make the process more rapid? So I think that would just be a good follow-up question on in terms of what you were talking about now. And then I think, um, you and Lisa can respond to the questions as they are in the chat, and I can just remind you of what those questions are if necessary. Yeah, no, thanks, B. Thanks. Great question. And maybe I'll make two general comments before I make some sort of recommendation or at least voice an opinion. So a rapid review as defined by Cochrane, I, I do believe is still a review that takes place within six months. So the 10 days is actually on the very extreme rapid side of the, the distribution there. Even three months, uh, according to that definition, is still quite rapid because you know, technically you would have another three months even if you, if you needed it. So on the one hand, anything less than half a month is still quite rapid. That's one comment I would make. The other comment is, and, and Lisa did point to this in the slides, a rapid review is in part defined by shortcuts that are taken within the process. That's how you can, that's one way you can get into this rapid time frame is, is taking these methodological shortcuts. But at a certain point, we were finding a bit hard to make these shortcuts for two reasons. On the one hand, we were getting some pressure from Cochrane and from peer reviewers um, to make sure that our methods were really only mar marginally different from what I would say are the methods for standard Cochrane reviews. So we were getting a push, I think, from that side not to take these shortcuts. And as Lisa also mentioned, I think we were realizing um, that if we were honest, not taking, taking these shortcuts were leading to small mistakes. And you know, none of these individual mistakes were of the magnitude that would lead to the conclusions changing. But um, on a whole, I think it was just a number of mistakes that we weren't necessarily comfortable with, which is why, you know, even independent of Cochrane and, and peer, reviewer, peer reviewers pushing for us maybe not to make certain shortcuts, we also came to a similar conclusion that where possible, we should be, you know, doing things as comprehensively as possible. 
Um, so B, with regards to kind of what my recommendation would be, and I'd be interested to hear Lisa's as well. I think it's not, I don't think it's sensible to, to aim for anything under three or four months for a review of this type, even if uh, the, press, the, the, the question is quite pressing. Um, I think the amount of work that needs to be done, the amount of work that needs to be spread across different individuals who do have other things they need to balance, um, anything shorter than this three months, also with extensive quality checks that need to be happening on the backside, um, I think it's just not really, um, even if it's somehow feasible, I don't think it's very sensible and it's definitely not sustainable. So I think, you know, I would, uh, if, if, if I was picking out a time frame for a really ambitious rapid review, I would shoot for maybe four months, but I wouldn't be even surprised if it pushed rather into the five or six month uh, time frame. I don't know, Lisa, do you have any more thoughts on that? No, I fully second what you just said. Um, and for example, for the school measures review, we definitely, uh, um, we conducted the searches in December and we just submitted the review in August. And we today the peer reviewers feedback came back by 11 peer reviews. So we're very excited to address that over the next um, days. Um, so I would say realistically, um, three months is very is very ambitious if you um, move out of the emergency mode. So if you move into regular working hours and regular days and regular um, taking care of your family <laughs> uh, kind of schedules, I think it's realistic to um, go for three months. Um, maybe to say that there could be pharmaceutical or more clinical um, questions that could be done in a shorter time um, frame very this very um, well-defined small scope questions that can be addressed by rap rapid reviews much faster but i think if you move out of the um, of that realm and move into for example public health measures um, and assessing the effectiveness i would say it's very um, realistic to yeah make this rather a three to six months rather than a one to three months. Um, and Jake mentioned that uh, for Cochrane, it's a six month period between search date and publication of review. We kind of um, got over this six months and we had to do, conduct upda update searches while not doing data extraction and critical appraisal on these studies, but we still had to do an update search. Um, yeah, and I think the update of this review is dooming. So <laughs> yeah, there will be more interesting things to come. Um, should we address the other questions that came up in text, or do you want to add to that question, Jake? No, um, and I was just, I had, I took a note of them as, I, as they were coming, Lisa, so maybe I can pose a couple to you and you can, uh, so one was, what do you mean exactly by intensive calibration? You can answer that question yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, intensive calibration, what did we mean by that? Um, we... Uh, did a calibration in um, title and abstract screening, full text screening, and in data extraction and in risk of bias assessment. So at four steps, we did calibration to make sure that um, data are consistent. Um, so we um, chose up to uh, 100, um, fit between 50 and 100 abstract titles and abstracts that we screened all of the people who worked on title and abstract screening. Um, we then um, discussed the screenings, all the people in the team, which sometimes was composed of eight people. So eight people joined a daily meeting on title and abstract screening and the progress on that. Um, there were intensive discussions about unclear cases and so forth. That's what we did for the title and abstract screening. For the full text screening, we um, always took between five and 10 studies, which um, we uh, uh, screened on a full text level within the full text screening team which was composed of um, almost the same number as the title and abstract team, usually between five and 10 people and discussed um, the unclear cases. Um, we had the rolling question sheet, which was usually dealt with by the person leading the full text um, screening team. So there was mo it was mostly one of us um, from the core review team that tried to answer all the rolling questions on a continuous basis. Um, and then we had a meeting to discuss the calibration and see how things went. And that was the same for all these steps. So we um, looked at the same studies, assessed them or extracted data on them, um, and then added to the rolling question sheet and had meetings on these calibration exercises. 
Yeah, and maybe just to, to once again, to emphasize what the aim is. The aim is to make sure that everyone that's taking part in a, in a specific task is completely on the same page with one another so that we're doing things in a standardized way and that at the end we can be confident that we we um, that everything should be quite harmonious that it's not that one person was you know misunderstood the eligibility criteria and applied them incorrectly and you know that's that's that obviously could apply to any systematic review i mean obviously you want everyone to be on the same page even if you take two years to do a review i think the difference is maybe you just have less time to correct mistakes so if you're really working on this compressed time frame, um, you know every every day is is quite important. And if you need you know two or three days to sort out a mistake because you know maybe not everyone was was extracting the same types of data, and you have to go back and look at every single study and re-extract that data, it just costs you time. Um, so you know it's obviously important for any systematic review. I would emphasize that, but I think it's even more important to do this type of intensive and extensive calibration uh, for rapid reviews. Someone asked about the types of risk of bias tools, um, and maybe I'll take that one on. So Lisa mentioned that we were looking at different types of studies. We included you know, everything ranging from randomized controlled trials, which so far we have not identified any yet. We know in future updates of these two reviews, we will have some randomized evidence. But we also considered um, you know, op different types of observational studies as well as modeling studies. And I think for everything except for modeling studies, the, the advantage is there's already quite a, uh, an established Cochrane frame for assessing the risk of bias of these types of studies. So for randomized controlled trials, it's the Cochrane Risk of Bias 2 tool. So it was updated um, a couple of years ago. For certain types of observational studies, it's um, Robin's eye. And actually, in both of our reviews, there was also certain studies that fit more of a, we'll say, like a diagnostic question. So if there were studies looking at testing at airports, for example, or testing within schools, those fit more of a diagnostic frame. And there's a risk of bias tool called Quadus 2, which is used for those types of studies. So I think for that, it was quite straightforward. There's a lot of guidance and there's established tools within the community for assessing risk of bias. Where we had, uh, where we were a bit on our own was related to modeling studies. So the travel review was the first one that we conducted and we did a quick search. Uh, we contacted other colleagues who worked in evidence synthesis. We contacted colleagues who work with modeling studies and we weren't able to find a satisfactory tool for assessing the risk of bias or the quality of modeling studies. So what we did is um, with colleagues that focus on modeling studies, we spent about a week uh, actually designing a bespoke tool of our own. Um, and now that tool has been used, I think, in four different reviews. And I think the, our experience has been quite good with it. So it focuses on um, you know, the input parameters of uh, modeling studies. Sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head, everything. It focuses on the uncertainty of studies, it focuses on the transparency of studies, and it focuses on the validation of the studies. So, um, you know, I, all that to say, there wasn't an established tool, we designed our own, and that has worked quite well. Um, and we can definitely share that tool for you to have a look at as well. It's, it's found within these published reviews, but I can also send you that after the fact, so the participants can look at it. Okay, Lisa, someone else asked what the rationale could be for doing uh, a rapid review with Cochrane. I assume uh, meaning as opposed to publishing it somewhere else. Um, well, I think you don't, we mostly refer to Cochrane guidance in this talk, right? So most of this refer, is kind of built around the, um, the organization or the collaboration of Cochrane. Um, you don't have to do that if you do not want to publish your review with Cochrane. Um, we wanted to publish our review with Cochrane to um, also increase the visibility of our review, but also to adhere to these very strict standards imposed on us by Cochrane. So if you want to publish with Cochrane, you need to go through that step. If you do not want to publish with Cochrane, there's no need to, to do so. Um, but it would still be recommendable to publish your protocol on Prospero or Open Science frame, Framework, which I think another question referred to, 
Open Science Framework is for free and Prospero is too. Um, the only problem is that you need to be at a very early stage of your process, so you should not have started working on your um, screening, I think, Jake. I'm not sure. There was like a, a certain limit where you couldn't re register your protocol anymore. So, um, and I think another question addressed that too. So can you still publish a protocol after your review has been published? Um, the answer to that question is uh, it's kind of pointless because you can't make the reference to your protocol in your publication by saying we had an a priori um, uh, protocol which had certain, um, yeah, which indicated certain decisions we made in the beginning before we conducted the review to make sure that we are limiting any risk of bias in the process. Um, so if you plan to uh, do a review of any sort, I would always recommend to register that either with Prospero or with Open Science Framework. Um, so you can reference that also in your publication. Yeah, and maybe one more point that we considered. Uh, we, we did consider for a more recent review not publishing with Cochrane, just because there are some some extra steps in the in the process with Cochrane that sometimes seem to be a bit um, cumbersome, maybe. But Lisa mentioned an evidence map that we worked on for the travel uh, related control measures, and this even with the accelerated peer review that this journal we submitted to uh, advertised. It took us 10 months to get this pub this published. Um, and that was actually, we always responded quite quickly with the resubmission, with, with responding to reviewer comment, comments, et cetera. It's just that the peer review process, as you all probably know, can take a long time. We had a more of an assurance with Cochrane that this process was going to be quite a lot quicker. So that was another thing we considered very pragmatic. How fast can we get this published um, with Cochrane as opposed to publishing somewhere else? But I think independent from that, as Lisa said, it's it's completely possible and legitimate to, to, to publish um, rapid reviews outside of Cochrane, just as is the case for systematic reviews. Another question from the chat um, was that, what advice would you give for teams asked to come up with rapid reviews to answer very urgent policy question in at most one to two days, especially those COVID related policy issues? Um, we were asked these questions too, especially in the beginning of the pandemic when there was no evidence out there and it was really hard to come up with um, very ad hoc um, systematic evidence um, and ad hoc kind of synthesis of the, the literature on a specific topic. When we were asked these kind of questions, um, what we did within the team, again, you have to set aside time. So you say, okay, three members of the team only work on this specific questions for three full days. So nothing else can be done in these three days. And what we did is we did uh, more or less employ a, a different process. So we would look in, um, at that time, it was still the um, WHO COVID-19 database. We would only look for systematic reviews on the topic, which of course at that time, some of them didn't, or there were no systematic reviews in the beginning. So we had to look at the primary studies on a specific topic. Um, but we try to kind of have a search strategy in place. So we would look for a specific school and um, closure and um, children, just a stupid example, but um, that's the kind of search strategy you would have. And we would only look in this one specific database. And I would say at the point we are now, what I would recommend um, is to have a systematic process in place. Um, a rep, there's something like a rapid response mechanism that you can employ. So you have a question that comes in, um, you try to turn that question, sometimes that the question which is um, given to you by decision makers is not really a systematic review or a review question in general. So you probably have to refine the question and make this something which you can address by a systematic process. And then I would recommend to look in COVID-19 specific databases, employing a search strategy for systematic reviews only. Look at all the systematic reviews which have been done in the area and try to, um, to kind of contextualize um, the conclusions from these systematic reviews for the specific context that you have to, um, to provide some, I don't know, summary for or um, evidence brief, whatever is the, the format of interest. Yeah, exactly. And I think just to summarize that, I think in one to two days, you just have to be realistic about what, what is possible. And, you know, what we, what Lisa walked us through today as, as being a rapid review, 
going through all of these steps within one to two, three days isn't, isn't realistic and it's not possible. So I think this type of very rapid process can still be very helpful, can still be very informative, um, and can probably be um, used by decision makers. It's just a little bit of a different product. And I think that's just important to realize that, um, that, that that's the case. Yes, and exactly. And the, the most common, the most recent comment that it's difficult to actually synthesize the results of such a very rapid process. I, yeah, that that's actually lines up very well with what we found, even employing, you know, a more kind of systematic review type approach. We also had quite difficulties um, pulling the various very different strains of evidence together into something that could hopefully be informative for decision makers. So Janine asked whether the involvement of experts um, using something like the Delphi method could enhance the rigor of rapid reviews, particularly with regard to the, the policy or the health systems research uh, question. So I think so. I think uh, if, if there's time, if there's you know, a, a process in place for doing this, um, making sure that the, the question is relevant to those end users that need the evidence in the end, there's only value in doing that. I think it ensures that um, the question's the right question and that the product will be the right product. Lisa mentioned that we, we had some processes in place for this, nothing so formal as a, as a Delphi method, um, but we were asking you know, certain end users to make sure that, that um, we, were, we were on the right track. But yeah, if, if there's time and resources for such a formal approach, I think you know, there's, there's only value in making sure you're asking the right questions. Um, I'm not sure whether I understand the question correctly, to be honest. Can the involvement of expert reviewers or the Delphi method enhance the rigor? Um, do you mean expert reviewers? Um, like, uh, I don't know, we had expert reviewers on board, um, <laughs> at least some of them. Um, <laughs> no, we had um, expert reviewers on board, and especially for the um, dealing with modeling studies, we had we brought a whole new team on board, which was um, having um, quite extensive modeling expertise. Um, so if that was the question, we had expert reviewers on board to work with a very specific body of evidence in the case of COVID-19 questions. Oh, experts in the field, sorry. <laughs> okay, well then I addressed two questions. One of them was asked and the other wasn't. Um, so sorry for that. Um, I think that was addressing the most of the questions in the chat so far, unless I missed something. How do we yeah, share our you. search strategy for peer review? Oh, sorry, B. No, no, go ahead. Um, how do we share our search strategy for peer review? Good question. Um, so what you can do, there are some ways you can do this. First, you could go via the Cochrane route where your search strategy will automatically be peer reviewed. The second route is get an information specialist on team on your team um, by uh, making them a co-author. So that's what we usually do. We just ask someone to work with us on a project and develop the search strategy for us in, and then kind of, um, how do you say, thanking them for their work by making them a co-author, that would be one way. Um, and uh, the third way is, um, which is probably the more expensive way is to register or you publish a protocol with journals like Systematic Reviews, um, which publishes protocols, the whole protocol will be peer reviewed, also a search strategy. Um, but since it's an uh, open access journal, it's quite expensive to, to pay for these kind of publications, but then you would have the peer review. So those are the three routes I'm aware of. Please chime in, Jake, and also B, if you know of any other. No, I think it's a great question because, I mean, that was in the Cochrane uh, guidance to have your search strategy peer reviewed. And I think that, um, I think if you go the Cochrane route, like we did, it's, it's quite simple because that's part of the process. I think the, the third option that Lisa mentioned, so actually trying to publish your protocol with systematic review. Here again, if there's time and resources, that's excellent, but it could take an extra half year easily to, to go that route. So I think sometimes that's just not feasible. Um, maybe just cold calling or like, you know, sending an unsolicited email to a Cochrane, the related Cochrane group sometimes might also be 
an option. And, you know, depending on how much time and capacity they have, I could imagine sometimes they would take the, the time to actually have a look at your search strategy in an informal way. But I agree that, that that's a, a little bit of a tricky situation um, to follow the Cochrane guidance related to that. I think the, the one thing that we've done as well is just to develop our search strategy in a very iterative manner as well, where it takes a lot of time because then you kind of have to improve your search and redo it. Um, but where we find a, a study, one or two studies that we kind of think um, meet the eligibility criteria of our review and use those as sort of a benchmark um, if we find them in our search, then we kind of know that our search is in the right direction. Um, and also using some of the terms that have been used in those two articles um, to identify further terms um, that could be added to our search strategy that we may have missed out on. Um, and then I think there's also the additional aspect of maybe doing just random searches in, in um, sort of Google Scholar to see if there are additional studies you could identify um, that you may have missed in your search. But of course, it is possible that you would have missed them if they were not in the database that you have um, covered in your review. Um, I think one question that I had for you, and I think this would be really beneficial, is just for you to, um, just briefly speak to what, what you know or think has happened to the evidence that has come from your rapid reviews. Um, you've published it. Are there other ways that you've disseminated it and kind of spread it and promoted sort of the uptake of that evidence into policy and practice? Um, and if you have kind of any tips and recommendations for that, because I think ultimately, if you're going to do an entire review, um, and as you saw with the rationale for doing it earlier on that policy, changing policy and practice is one of the kind of objectives. So uh, maybe if you could just briefly speak to that experience. Um, and then I think there are a few last questions which we'll, we'll take after that um, and, and we can wrap up. Yeah, I'll start B because I think Lisa has, her experience with the school review has been quite a bit more extensive than, than mine with the travel review. Um, I think we had the, the benefit of, of, of actually being commissioned by the WHO on this review. So this was a, a question that they had identified as being a pressing question that needed to be answered. And um, basically the review was taken directly and um, led to kind of the recommendations at the international level that the WHO was working on related to international travel. We did some additional dissemination work within uh, Europe, sharing this with things like the European Commission, um, the German kind of uh, ministry for, uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember which ministry it was, but basically the one that, that deals with international travel. And there was some interest in that, um, some, but, but we don't have any idea whether that was necessarily taken up. So um, I think with regard to the travel review, we did have this one very concrete outlet for dissemination that we knew was policy relevant, but we could have done a much better job, I think, of thinking through a much more concrete way of trying to translate this um, in a way that could be taken up for, for policymakers worldwide. But I'll hand over to Lisa because I know they've done a lot more work on the school's review with this. Um, no, I well, I think more or less uh, the outlets we had the, were similar. So of course, we had the Cochrane publication. But what we did, and that's also one of the reasons why our review took um, much longer than we expected initially, was that we, when we prioritized the topic of reopening schools, um, which was done so with a panel of stakeholders at different levels, so the National Public Health Authority, but also on a more regional um, level, um, the we quickly kind of found out that we need to make this a guideline to develop like a national guidelines on how to safely reopen schools. Um, and we then moved on to for like go through a very, um, very structured guideline development process in Germany where you have to form a group and then you have to invite the group and define your research questions and so forth and then coming up with, with a recommendation. So while I was co coordinating this process, I was also conducting the Cochrane review and the questions which were raised by the guideline group were a bit different from the questions, of course, raised in our Cochrane review. So we had to do two different synthesis. One of them was informing the guideline um, and the other one was going into the Cochrane review. 
But um, that also had the consequence that our knowledge translation process was, was much um, more direct, um, turning it really into high level policy in Germany. By um, We had a presentation on the guideline with the, um, the Ministry for Education and Research in Germany, um, and it was widely um, covered by the media in Germany in very different ways, as it sometimes happens for research findings, right? Um, so that's um, that was kind of a, a very um, big process, which uh, partly was not uh, initiated um, by us in that way. And then we also had um, evidence briefs and issue briefs that we shared through various platforms. So there was um, some activities with that. We had um, a couple of presentations with the WHO, um, which formed an expert group on educational questions. And yeah, um, a couple of other outlets, media interviews um, with uh, the news, with newspapers, with national television, um, radio stations, and so forth, um, which is really mostly triggered by um, the media approaching us for um, our findings and uh, how to, um, what to do with them. Because of course, I mean, school meshes, as you can imagine, and I think that's a global um, fact that have been of such a high relevance and are still, so we're still looking at questions um, and we're still being addressed like we on a weekly basis by um, the media to respond to certain questions of how to deal with certain challenges in schools. Yeah, so that's the, we didn't really have a, a nice KT strategy, B. I'm very sorry, <laughs> failed in that. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa um, and Jake. I think this was really helpful. I think there's um, one last question that I think will be helpful for everyone. Um, so there's a question about a template or a standard, a standardized way of reporting a rapid review. I mean, we know that we've got Prisma for systematic reviews and scoping reviews. Does something like that exist for rapid reviews, for example? It's exactly the same. <laughs> Yeah, as far as I know, there's not a separate product exactly. I think um, at least the way that Cochrane does it, the results are more or less identical to those of a of a of a normal systematic review. You know, you have an inclusion, the, the description of the included studies, kind of from a PICO perspective. You have a description of the risk of bias. You have the effects, and then you have uh, the certainty, uh, the grade assessment at the end. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, thank you both so much. Um, I think I also just learned again <laughs> new things about rapid reviews, um, and I'm sure everyone did as well. There were, there were quite a lot of questions, um, so I think this will be, uh, this was really fantastic. Um, and what is really great is that there will be um, a follow up webinar um, on rapid reviews next week. Um, which will also be um, looking at um, real world examples. And I think Lisa, you really started well to demonstrate how you use rapid reviews for the COVID-19 pandemic. So there will be um, more examples next week on rapid review, a rapid review that actually uses qualitative studies. Um, so that will be a different kind of qualitative review and not necessarily looking at the effectiveness of interventions. Um, as well as a collaboration um, that took place between the Department of Health and Cochrane South Africa, where they have conducted um, rapid reviews for COVID-19 as well. And they didn't use um, necessarily the Cochrane methods, ironically, um, but they, they actually tried to make it really rapid and tried to respond to the government's need um, during this time. So that will also be a very good um, example for, for you all to be able to, um, to see. Um, so I think the, there was a, la a last question about guidance for conducting um, rapid qualitative um, reviews. So that will be on for next week's sessions. Um, and I don't see any other questions. Um, I've put the link to the evaluation in the chat. Um, it would be really great to get feedback. Um, it was really helpful. I did try and um, pass on some of this to Lisa and Jake, and we in, tried to include more examples in the presentation um, as compared to the first session. So um, we do use your feedback um, and we do really appreciate it. And thank you so much for attending today's session. 
um, we will send you the recording to the link and we'll also attach, um, I'll specifically look for the for the papers that um, Lisa and Jake were referring to, um, where you'll also be able to see the risk of bias tool um, that they were able to adapt and develop. Thank you so much, everyone, um, and take care. Thanks for the great questions, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm going to post our email address in the chat just if you are uh, interested in uh, getting in touch and also for sharing materials. Um, for example, the modeling tool, just um, write us an email and we'll make sure to get things to you if you need them, if you do any stuff on modeling studies, for example. There was one question which we didn't answer, which I'm just quickly addressing on qualitative rapid evidence synthesis. I'm sure there is guidance, but not from the Cochrane collaboration. So I think the JBI has guidance on rapid qualitative evidence synthesis B, you might be better informed than I am. Yeah, um, so we, what we usually, uh, what I've seen is that uh, people have been using the Cochrane QES, the qualitative evidence synthesis methods, um, and really just uh, deciding, making decisions about which um, aspects to shorten. But um, Catherine Houghton, who's conducted the rapid QES, will be here next week to address more of those questions and to provide input. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.